So, so yeah, I was not I'm sorry. Um, I I'm still outstanding from previous weeks. Right. So since I wasn't on it, but I did listen to it, um, I kind of got a little confused at the end. You guys ended up with reading Isaiah and Psalm, uh, and, and uh, yeah, Psalm and Mark. And then there was like a section on the handout that says, in the resurrection, Jesus is depicted both as, and I kind of got the suffering Savior and crucified Messiah. Is that kind of right for those blanks? Because I'm kind of anal. I like to fill in these blanks. <laughs> so, but I wasn't sure where the who is and through being part was. So so in Isaiah, of course, we have this uh, discussion of the suffering servant, uh, mm -hmm. the one who served God. And in the course of that is, uh, is suffering because of that. Mm -hmm. But at the end... Uh, this person is presented with blessing and will his name will be made known. Um, and in Psalm 22, the righteous person who does not deserve the suffering that uh, he's undergoing at the end turns to praise of God and uh, understanding that God will uh, deliver him. And so both of those taken together, when we look at it with the resurrection, Jesus is both the suffering servant in Isaiah and he is the suffering righteous person uh, in Psalm 22. So there is suffering in both of these people kind of from different angles. Um, but like the suffering servant in Isaiah and like the psalmist, he is ultimately vindicated by God. And the psalmist and Isaiah both talk about how that happens in their lives. But for Jesus, that ultimate vindication by God, that ultimate deliverance from God, is the resurrection so rather than being vindicated by um having his enemies put to shame or having his name uh made known um he is vindicated in the resurrection because unlike the suffering servant and unlike the suffering righteous person uh jesus actually dies in the course of his ministry is that uh does that answer your question? And does that make sense uh, for everybody else? Yes. I think I got it. Fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Other other questions? I just have one one question from the um, the last reading that we did on the passion. It was just kind of interesting that Mark's version doesn't have any um, uh, with the, with the two that get the two convicts that are um, hung with him on the cross, uh, neither one repents or acknowledges Jesus, unlike the other uh, other um, uh, other un, unlike uh, Matthew and Luke. And I'm just wondering what the if there's any story behind that. Well, that's actually only in Luke um, that you have the the penitent criminal up on the cross um okay i can remember back from when we studied luke i think the now again that's only in luke so i guess is he probably got that from whatever that source was where he found some of his parables and some of the traditions about jesus birth uh, so mark may not have had access to that but for luke that really um is in line with his depiction of Jesus. Jesus has come uh, and, and he is proclaiming the kingdom. He is, because uh, remember in Luke, repentance is really um, important in a way that it is not as, as in, or in a way that's different than the other gospels. So for Luke, Jesus being able to witness to the kingdom of God and finding uh, a person who is willing to repent and walk that kingdom way, even from the cross. He's, he's doing his ministry right to the very last moment uh, in Luke's gospel. Um, so he is still actively reaching out to the outcast uh, there. Um, you know, there's, I don't know if there's anyone more outcast than someone being crucified. So I think for Luke, that really um, highlights some things that are important for him. Um, in Mark, Mark is very committed. It is very important to get Jesus on the cross. 
uh, where he gives his life as a ransom for many, as Jesus says. So um, what's going on around him is maybe less important. Uh, I think the only comment it makes about the people who were there with him was that the uh, those who were crucified with him also taunted him. So I think in Mark, the depiction really highlights that suffering servant, that suffering Messiah idea that Mark is um, really working hard to um, help us understand. Does that kind of speak to your question? Yep. Okay. Very good. All right. I feel like I'm two for two so far. I I must wonder if I should stop for the night. Um, so <laughs> we, uh, I have told you for probably two months now, um, people have said, you know, what is this thing where Jesus is saying, uh, you know, don't tell anybody about this. I said, hold that, we'll get to it. Well, here we are. We are getting to it. Okay. So, yes. Um, so, hold on a second. Who is Jesus? Well, we've talked about how that changes as we move from location to location. Who is Jesus? We need to look to our Old Testament to really understand that. Um, but the other thing that Mark has going on, remember we started the topic, who is Jesus, by noting that there's a lot of discussion or a lot of people asking, who is Jesus? What is he doing? How does he get to do this? And there's not a ton of answers. Um, and, and we'll, just, we'll just look at a couple examples of that here. Uh, Kim, will you share with us, please, uh, Mark 3, 11 and 12? Ra, uh, Renee, will you share with us, please, Mark 7, 35 and 36? Robin, will you share with us Mark 8, 29 and 30? And Tom, will you share with us Mark 9, 9? And you'll have to unmute yourselves as you go. The, fewer open microphones we have, the, the better the sound is. Okay, this is under a multitude at the seaside. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and shouted, you are the son of God. But he sternly ordered them not to make him known. We've got a, there you go. I did. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that. Renee, I'm, I'm not hearing you. Oh. You're, you're unmuted, but I couldn't, I couldn't hear you. Hmm. I don't know why. Now I hear you. Can you hear me now? You know, I, I have my Bible over at the side of my computer, and I have the all-in-one computer with everything in the front. So let me start again then. Um, Mark 7, 35. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. The more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Okay. We'll see you in chapter 8. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. Christ, and he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Okay, and this is with respect to the trans, uh, transfiguration. As they came down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has risen from death. So, and of course, as we know from spending the amount of time with Mark that we have spent with Mark, we could go on, but I just wanted to give you a sampling here. Um, yeah, why Why all the secrecy? What, what are people's best guesses? Especially because at the beginning, Jesus is going around um, proclaiming the kingdom of God. 
and the kingdom is here. The time is fulfilled. He is trying to spread a message, and at the same time, he is ordering people not to talk about him. Um, what's our guess on what's going on here? Maybe they don't. He doesn't want to become like an idol. Maybe they don't. He doesn't want the focus on himself. He wants it to be about God mm. and what God has blessed him to be able to do. Want, wants to have people direct their uh, their devotion in the proper direction. Okay. Particularly if, as I think you can make the case in Mark, Jesus, his awareness that he is the son of God, we're, we're not 100% sure. Um, so yeah, maybe he is just trying to help people understand that the one we truly worship is God. Okay. Other thoughts? Well, I'm, I don't know if this would uh, um, hold water, but I, it's kind of like a Chinese telephone. You know, you to say, don't tell anybody. And how many of these stories do people go out and tell everybody? So, so maybe it's almost a reverse psychology. Uh, yeah. You know, this was nothing if not a person with a keen understanding of people. So may, maybe this was on purpose. He knew, um, you know, don't tell anybody about this. Keep it a secret. And what's the first thing folks are going to do? Hey, I've got a secret, but you got to promise not to tell anybody else. Um, so yeah, may, maybe Jesus was using that um, that kind of foible of people to his advantage. I think another possibility, though, a, a different thought would be that um, he didn't want things to get out of hand. He knew he was the suffering servant, and and he knew what his ultimate ultimate um, outcome was going to be. And, and perhaps if things got out of hand and there was you know, mass movement or mass hysteria, that that could get in the way of his, of his ultimate mission. That's just my thought. Okay, so he's trying to kind of keep things from, from going off the rails at a yes. certain point. If there's too much hype around him, he's gonna attract attention before he's completed his mission. I thought maybe um, he would uh, want some time to kind of rally the troops and uh, establish himself as the suffering savior or servant. Okay, so he's got to um, bring people in. He's got to help people understand who he is before they go out and talk about him. Yes. Okay. So... Um, as you can probably guess, this is a question that people have wondered almost ever since Mark wrote the book. Why all the secrecy? Matthew and Luke pick up on a little bit of, uh, of this, not to the extent that Mark does. Um, and John, of course, it, it's just right out there at the beginning. You know, here's Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's God's son. And he knows it the whole time and is not shy about telling people. Um, so there, uh, the scholarly phrase for this phenomenon is the messianic secret. Uh, and in 1901, a uh, German biblical scholar and Lutheran theologian, uh, Wilhelm Vrede, wrote a book called Das Messiah Geheimnis in, der Event in den Evangelien. Um, and in this book, he really did a scholarly uh kind of systematic uh analysis of this motif of jesus commanding people to be silent about being the messiah so Vreda was familiar with a very early tradition and that early tradition was that jesus never claimed the title of messiah for himself it was only given to him by other people. Vreda believed that Mark wrote his gospel partially to explain this. Why is it that everyone else calls Jesus the Messiah when he will not, when he does not claim the title for himself? And Vreda's answer based on Mark is that actually goes all the way back to Jesus. Um, 
he never claimed the title of Messiah because that's not what Jesus did. Um, so Mark tips us off at the beginning at uh, chapter one, verse one. Here's the story of Jesus, the Messiah. Um, he's God's son. And then throughout a lot of the rest of the gospel, it is, no, don't tell people who you think I am. Don't tell people who you think I am. And it could have been for any of those reasons that, um, that you named earlier. Uh, it could have been he did not want the crowds around him to get out of hand. It could have been he did not want to attract undue attention at the wrong time. Um, someone mentioned this morning, uh, you know, maybe it was not not the appointed moment yet. And I said, if we were reading John's gospel, that would be right on because Jesus comes out and says that in John's gospel. You know, you're not going to do anything to me now because God says it's not going to happen now. Um, so there is a... There is a, a school of, of scholarly thought that says perhaps the reason Jesus never claimed the title of Messiah for himself was he did not believe he was the Messiah. Uh, after all, his mission ended with him getting crucified. Um, this theory then goes on to say that rather than admit they had followed a guy who got executed, the disciples then said, well, actually, um, Jesus is the Messiah. He just didn't want to claim the title for himself. Um, so that they claimed he was the Messiah to kind of rehabilitate him uh, because they had dropped everything to follow him. Uh, I personally do not buy that, um, but it, it is another explanation that kind of plays into Vreda's contention that the reason Jesus tells people to be quiet about him is he never claims the title for himself. Um, let me stop there. Thoughts? Reactions. But he claimed the title of Christ, right? Jesus claimed the title of Christ. Well, we'll we'll get there in Mark's gospel. Let's let's first start with uh, that. That's a very good segue to um, to kind of a what I think is a better understanding or explanation. So, um, Christ and Messiah are actually interchangeable. Um, Messiah, it comes from the Hebrew word for anointed. Um, so kings were anointed, prophets were anointed, priests were anointed. We're definitely going to learn about that when we study Leviticus, uh, probably after Lent. And, um, so for example, uh, Cyrus the Great was called a Messiah. He was... Uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible, he is called Messiah. He's called one of God's anointed because he defeats the Babylonians and lets God's people return to the promised land. So a Messiah is somebody who is anointed to do a specific task for God. Um, when they translated uh, these texts into Greek, they used the Greek word Christos, which means anointed. So they just said, well, this means anointed. What's the Greek word for anointed? Christos. So um, that is where the title Christ comes from. So Messiah and Christ are actually interchangeable. And if we look at our footnotes in a couple of these verses we're going to read in a moment, we'll see that. Um, so he is Jesus, the anointed one. But in the period between kind of when they stopped writing the books that became the Old Testament and Jesus' time, there developed this idea of not just there are several people who come and at different points in time are messiahs, you know, people God has appointed for a specific thing, but there there is the messiah. There is the one that is chosen and anointed by God to usher in uh, either the age to come, the messianic age, uh, the world as, as it will be, whatever that next thing that God is going to do. And there began to be a belief that God would, would have a Messiah to do this. Now, uh, we've talked before a little bit about how people probably had, that there were a variety of ideas of who the Messiah might be and what the Messiah might be like. 
and where all this comes back together, because some of you might be thinking, Eric, you're, 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 you're circling the field here a lot before you land, but it all comes back together. Mark is deliberately redefining what Messiah means so that people understand that Jesus is it. Um, so this word Messiah or Christ, um, it is only used seven times in the entire book of Mark, 16 chapters, and it's used seven times. And there are only four of those times when we can say without question that it is applied to Jesus. So there's only four times that Christ is actually applied to Jesus. Let's take a look at what those four are. Um, Carol, will you go ahead and share with us, please, Mark 1.1? 1, 1. Uh, Lindsay, if you can share with us Mark 8, 27 through 31. Uh, Nick, if you can share Mark 14, 61 through 64. And Andrew, if you can share with us, please, Mark 15, 31 and 32. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So remember, Mark tips us off to this right, right at the beginning. So everything else we read, we read with that understanding. So let's, let's jump now to chapter 8. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of, is it Caesar Caesarea? Caesarea Okay, thank you. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. Okay. Let's jump to the middle of the Passion story, chapter 14. This is in front of the council. But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do you still why do you still need witnesses? You heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. All right. And what do we find in chapter fifteen? In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also helped insult him. So here in, in my NRSV there, it says, let the Messiah, the King, come down. And in Andrew's text, it said... Uh, let the Christ come down. But I have the footnote here. Um, if I can find it in this little teeny tiny type, the Messiah or the Christ. So we see that those being interchangeable there. Mine has or Messiah in the footnote also. Ah, okay. So it, it they, they both just, of them. They just, they, they just flipped over on the footnote. Right. Could be could be one way or the other. So we've only we only have the term Christ or Messiah, God's anointed one who is coming to do a specific job for God, it's only applied to Jesus four times. Now, the first time, of course, is just so you all know this is who Jesus is. But the other times when it's applied to Jesus, what is the common thread? Anytime they talk about Jesus as the Christ or the Messiah, what else are they talking about? So chapter 8, 
what is the what is the prediction that Jesus gives? Peter names him as the Christ or the Messiah, and what is the very next thing Jesus after he says, "Don't tell anybody"? What is the very next thing that he says? Yeah, he's going to suffer and die. Uh, chapter fourteen, he's standing before the council. You know, are you the Messiah? And he says, "Yes, I am the Messiah." And what is the very next thing the priest says? Blasphemed. He's blasphemed. What's the penalty for blasphemy? Death. Death. Yeah. Are you the Christ? I am. That's fine. You're going to die. The final time they call him the Christ, and they're doing it ironically, what is actually happening to Jesus as they say that? They are He's being out. crucified. He's being crucified. He's actually in the process of dying. So every time they apply the term Christ to Jesus... Jesus, in one way or another, ties it to his death. Although I might add, earlier on you are talking about some scholars stating that Jesus was not admitting that he was the Messiah. Clearly, first of all, he's in one section, he says he's the Messiah. When Peter brought the issue up, if he was not the Messiah at that time, he clearly would have been in a position where he would have been expected to deny that he was the Messiah. So I think all these times by either his own words or by his action and his, and his silence, he has ascended, ascended to the fact that, that is indeed who he is. So I think that right. eviscerates an earlier this argument that some who have made that he is yes. not the Messiah. So, so hold that thought. He, the time when somebody says, are you the Messiah? And he says, yes, he knows that is going to get him killed. So when he claims the title, it is linked to his death. Now, the other interesting thing, if we turn to chapter 9, verse 9, like I said, I promise all of this is coming back together. <laughs> um, so as Tom shared with us earlier, they're coming down from the mountain after transfiguration. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So in other places, there's just a blanket prohibition. Don't tell anybody. But here, what's what's different? He wanted to wait until he had uh, been risen. Right. He, he set the time limit on it. He says, don't tell anybody yet. When I have died and God has resurrected me, then you can tell people who I am. So, well, that makes pragmatic sense because the fact that he was doing his mission on earth, the last thing he wanted to do was color the water with people getting all hung up on his claim to be the Messiah. And everything would have stopped that particular point, and he would have never been able to move forward with his other mission, or the, the, the foundation for his mission, that is. Exactly. <laughs> so if Jesus has just done an exorcism, like we heard about this past Sunday, and people are going out and saying, this guy, Jesus, he's the Messiah. He's the real deal. He does exorcisms. What are people going to think the Messiah is all about? Exorcism. Exorcism. Yeah, the Messiah is an exorcist. Okay. You know, it's like demons or stuff that's against God and the Messiah kicks him out. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of regular Messiah stuff. I get that. No, Jesus says, no, don't tell anybody yet because, like Andrew said, you're going to color the water. You're going to, to cloud people's vision of what I actually am here to do. Jesus uh, heals people. Don't tell anybody. If we find out, hey, you know, this guy, Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, you know, he gave sight to this blind guy. Um, you know, he, he cured some people. What are people going, what assumption are people going to make about what the Messiah is all about? A healer. Yeah, he's, he's a healer. You know, you, you go to him. He's, he's good for what ails you. Um, you know, Jesus feeds 5,000 and walks on water. Don't tell anybody. Um, what are people, what assumption are people going to make about the Messiah? Walk on water. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's a miracle worker. He, he can mm -hmm. control the forces of nature. Um, you know, he can feed people. Uh, and again, the ability to feed people is a fantastic thing. Um, 
But that is not the full picture of what the Messiah does. Jesus is trying to reveal that God is working through death and resurrection. So Jesus wants to keep the identity of Messiah or Christ hidden until people have the full picture, until after he has risen from the dead. Um, and then, remember, what does he tell the women on Easter morning? He says, go and tell people. Go tell people what you have seen. So now that they have the complete picture, now that he has died and God has resurrected him, he is that suffering servant whom God vindicates in the resurrection. Now and only now can you tell people that Jesus is the Messiah because he is redefining what it means to be the Messiah. He's partly miracle worker. He's partly healer. He's partly exorcist. But more than anything else, he is the crucified and risen Messiah, because that is how God chooses to work. Um, let me stop there. Does that does that assessment of the messianic secret hold water for people? Get some new wine skin. <laughs> we'll take that. In fact, I, I like holding wine better than holding water. I have a question. Amen. Yes. Did uh, Jesus actually heal all the folks that wanted to be healed? Do we have any idea? Uh, as far as I know, we, we have no idea. I don't know that there's any instance where Jesus says, no, I'm not going to heal you. Um, so the gospel for this coming Sunday is out of Mark chapter 1. And they say they brought the whole... All the people who were sick or possessed with demons, the whole city was gathered at the door, and he cured many who were sick. Is there a difference between saying, you know, the whole city was there and he cured many who were sick? I, I don't know. I don't remember having translated this before, that being a significant difference linguistically. Um, certainly, Jesus did not heal everybody everywhere who needed healing. But again, I think the fact that he did this wherever he went, people were healed, I think, again, is more about, um, it's another way of Jesus proclaiming what God's kingdom is like. Um, he's kind of giving us, giving us a preview. He says, this is the, the first phase. You're going to see, it's like the first phase of the vaccine. Not everybody who wants to get vaccinated is getting vaccinated yet, but we have the we we have the assurance, I will say, that at some time, hopefully sooner rather than later, everybody who wants a vaccine will get a vaccine. Everybody who wants healing from Jesus is going to get healing from Jesus, but his ministry here in Galilee and in Jerusalem. They are, they are a preview. They are a first phase, a down payment on God's kingdom. And that payment is sealed by his death and resurrection because that is the ultimate healing that God is going to offer. It's not necessarily a removal of whatever is taking health and life away, but it is God overcoming that. Um, Carol, I don't know if that actually answered your question or if that just <laughs> a chance to. Well, uh, <clears throat> that was a, a nice uh, uh, compilation there. And I like how you drew it today. Um, and I guess uh, that's another question at the pearly gates. <laughs> <laughs> <They asked. laughs> Add it to the list. Yes. Yes, there's definitely some things that I, I'm going to see if I can find some answers on. Um, but, um, other thoughts on this idea of the messianic secret being, we need to keep it a secret until we have the whole picture. We don't want to jump to any conclusions that would be not a faithful understanding of who Jesus is. What you appreciate it more if you happen to see the whole picture and come to the conclusion, right? Absolutely. 
Um, and of course, in Mark, we we see the whole picture. We see him resurrected, and that's when the messenger says, "Go and tell people." We've had fifteen chapters of "Don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody." And of course, like we said earlier, maybe Jesus did that on purpose. Don't tell anybody. I can't keep it in anymore. I got to tell you, Jesus is the Messiah. <laughs> and so he says, don't tell anybody. They go and tell people. Finally, chapter 16, somebody says, Jesus is resurrected. Go and tell people. And how does the gospel end? They fled from the tomb and they didn't say a word to anybody. <laughs> so just... So we, we get the whole picture, but like we said when we talked about the ending, we understand the picture is, even the whole picture of Jesus' ministry is a partial picture of what God is up to. You know, I, I got to tell you a story. Uh, I was a Hindu uh, in Shubhanville, Ohio. And I decided to go to a Bible study class, which happened to be the Gospel of Mark. I didn't know anything about Jesus. We are studying Mark. When we got to about chapter 4 or 5, I finally told the pastor, I give up. Who is Jesus coming? Is he incarnation of God? Who is he? Everybody's going around saying different things, but I just want to know who he is. Now, how would you answer, how would you answer my question if I were to ask that question? <laughs> I can feel the uh, Jesus, give, give me a moment to try and put this into as few words as possible. Jesus is the living human embodiment of God who demonstrates for us what God's will is for us and shows us in his life, how far God's love is willing to go uh, to bless us, to heal us, and to restore us. Not bad on the fly. Good job. I, it's a question I've thought about before. You know, don't don't get me wrong. I didn't just make that all up right now. But. I would I would hope so. <laughs> So would, would, would that, uh, w what might your response to, to that answer have been? Well, the, the response I got from the pastor at that time who was teaching it, he's the incarnation of God. He's the person of God who became human. And he, I didn't know at that time that he died for the sins of people who crucified you, was resurrected. I didn't know any of that at that time. But he kind of explained that in a short, short few minutes. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, well, as I think we've learned from studying Mark's gospel, how we answer that question, who is Jesus? Um, it's not necessarily a simple question to answer, but I think right here we, we have a prime example of why it's important that we make a good faith effort to answer that question. I have, a, I have a couple of other kind of just general Mark discussion questions, but before we, we get there, let me ask other, other questions, other thoughts, observations. Well, Pastor, you're, you're talking about all the secrecy and how um, he tells everybody to not tell but in my Bible, and I believe it's the uh, um, teaching one, it says there's one episode in chapter 5, 19 and 20, where he does go and tell somebody to go out and tell. That's the only episode. Uh, um, and it's chapter 5, 19 to 20, and he tells them, go forth and tell what you have um, been done for you. Go tell people what the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. I, I could see that. I could see that not necessarily being at cross purposes. He doesn't say, go tell people that I'm the Messiah. He says, look right. what God has done. Um, right. so kind of like what we were talking about, uh, a couple people had mentioned earlier, maybe 
Jesus not wanting to take that title of Messiah has to do with his, uh, his love of God. He said, if I take the title of Messiah, people are going to worship me and not God, who we really should be worshiping. So, yeah, that, that is kind of interesting, but it, it does, it, it's like the exception that proves the, um, the other interesting thing about that story there in chapter five is the guy wants to leave and follow Jesus. Jesus um, obviously is okay with that. He tells people, follow me, but this guy, he says, no, you stay here where people know you and you tell them about what God has done. Um, so yeah, maybe that's, a, a different kind of ministry that Jesus is inviting him into, but yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting, uh, interesting contrast there. But Jesus also kept asserting that he was the son of man many times. In other words, he didn't want to claim his divinity, but he was claiming his humanity and people, he wanted people to think that he is just another Joe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that title, Son of Man, is is interesting. I, if memory serves, the, the best, um, I can't remember the grammatical term now, but the, the, the best thing we have that helps us understand where that comes from is in the book of Daniel, which is what Jesus cites when he's before the council. He says, you will see one like a son of humanity coming in the clouds. So this idea that God's agent is going to be a person. Uh, Daniel calls him the son of humanity. Um, and in Greek, there are different words. So there's a word for human, just like we have in English. Human just means a human. But there's also a word for man, like a anatomically male person, and there's a word for woman. Um, so every time it's in the New Testament, he's the son of, of human, so the son of humanity. Um, just as it is, I believe, in, uh, in Daniel. So um, yeah, that son of humanity, uh, on the face of it, may be it is emphasizing his humanity, but I think it also will link people back to this notion from Daniel that God's appointed agent, God's Messiah, is going to come as a person. He is going to be a son of humanity. Um, so I think Jesus is counting on people making that connection. So in, in the tradition of the small catechism, uh, what does this mean? Um, what does having a suffering Messiah mean for us as Christians? What, what difference does that make in how we understand our faith, how we practice our faith, uh, how our faith shapes us and strengthens us? What, what does having a suffering Messiah mean? I just think that he was, you know, truly human and has gone through everything that we've gone through. And then, um, you know, we've certainly sinned, and but he died to erase our sins. That's a lot so of what I get. That suffering, you, uh, that, that suffering Messiah or suffering Savior uh, kind of speaks to God's, God's credibility. Um, God understands exactly why we need uh, saving because this is, you know, because of the suffering that we may live through. That'll preach. In fact, I probably have preached a sermon on that at some point and probably will again. <laughs> so, the only time Jesus suffered at the end of a crucifixion, right? There was no account of his suffering up to that point. I'm sorry, can you say that again? I'm I'm getting a lot of noise in the back there. Suffering part of Jesus comes only at the end, right? Right. I mean, up to that point, 
there was no mention of any kind of suffering. It's just the very end, the trial and the crucifixion. Right. Well, and remember that that's critically important for Mark that we understand that. Um, but yeah, it does. It's only two chapters of his of his book. Um, but I think he's really clear in saying you can't really understand Jesus apart from that. Um, so even though there is less ink on it, I think it is still really critically important for, for Mark as to how we understand who Jesus is. Now, of course, Matthew, Luke, and John, and Paul lift up other aspects of Jesus' life uh, that, that shape our faith. Um, but suffering's not necessarily always physical. I mean, he suffered in in what he saw people doing, um, how they disrespected God, um, idolized others, you know, didn't have faith at times. So I think he suffered in those ways too, not just physically at the end. I think he, you know, suffered emotionally through his life. Hmm. However, I think the suffering at the end is very, uh, it, it, it deals with God's balance and justice in here. Uh, as in the Old Testament, the Lord delights in a just measure. And in this particular thing, someone had to pay something for something, and Jesus Christ paid it. Hmm. Uh, so, I, so adding on to what Kim, Kim was saying, I agree with her, but I think the one thing I would state here is that this is God's just measure, and someone had to pay. And there's only one that could pay. And that's why the suffering kept coming through. And, and in the Jewish culture and religion, of course, they, they d dwelt on fair dealing, just measures, pay your dues, pay what you owe. An eye for an eye. Absolutely. And this, is, this was the just measure being paid. Mm -hmm. And they, they kept focusing on that. And... Uh... <laughs> You know, in chapter 10 of Mark's gospel, Jesus says, the son of humanity came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And of course, it's it's a ransom. It is money paid to free someone else or a price paid to free someone else. So, um, yeah, that suffering Messiah, it, it has implications for how we understand the way God works. I think the idea of we can trust that God knows what it is to suffer. I think it also is a um, reminder to us. I think sometimes even very faithful people fall into the trap of saying, I've got this bad thing going on in my life. That must mean God is gone. Or when I'm suffering, God is not here. Um, and I think having a suffering Messiah reminds us that no, God, God is present even in that suffering. Just because something bad is happening to you does not mean that God has abandoned you. Um, so I think that's an important thing for us to remember, too. Um, yes. How do you see Mark's gospel... Uh, the way it tells the story of Jesus' life and ministry, how do you see it shaping uh, a community, a congregation, a church, um, Christianity as a whole? Um, what what would a community shaped by Mark's gospel look like? They were facing a rough time at that time with the destruction of the temple that's going to happen, persecution by Nero. Um, so I would imagine the gospel would help them endure, survive. Yeah, it's, it's a community that is understands God's presence even in the midst of that suffering. And I I would go so far as to say that that was not limited to the early church. I think there are, if not everywhere, but certainly places in every time that could embrace that 
uh, that teaching, that we are a community that endures. We are a community that um, God sustains through what's going on. Dare I say it, maybe right at this moment, we are a community that endures, that God sustains through uh, insanity going on around us. That'll preach. I might, I might have to take that one, Nick. What, what part of, of uh, Mark's depiction of Jesus it speaks to you the most? Uh, like I said, we spend a lot of time with how Mark answers that question, who is Jesus? Um, what part of who Jesus is in Mark's gospel really builds up your faith or really challenges your faith? Say more, the, the passion, yes. You felt the, the pain of all the people around him and he was willing to do what he could to help them ease the pain. Yes, the, the compassion of Jesus, absolutely. Uh, yeah, he's he's very hands-on. He's very, very much about embodying God's healing here for people. Absolutely. We've been kind of focusing on how Mark is different than the other gospels, but I think one part that we can focus on where it's the same as all the other gospels is it is still a focus on Jesus Christ. You know, it, it may be a little bit different view on it, but it's a focus mm -hmm. on Jesus Christ. And the final statement is Jesus Christ paying for our sin. Yeah. And those are the, those are, that is a similarity that shows that this is indeed congruent and agrees with the other gospel. Yeah, the, the central focus is, is Jesus, no matter what aspects each gospel highlights a little differently. The focus is always on Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Savior, Jesus, the one God sends um, to inaugurate the kingdom. Um, repentance, forgiveness, restoration, resurrection. Um, Jesus does all those things in Mark. Um, we get different details of how he does that in uh Matthew, Luke, and John, but yeah, they, they share that, that common understanding. Um, of, of that Jesus. part about Jesus paying for our sins, um, for salvation, that part doesn't come to the gospel so much. It's in all levels, all at the one. He explained it so well that we earn ourselves, we, we are granted salvation because Jesus paid for our sins. You don't see that much in the gospel. You mm -hmm. have to see it in the gospel. Um, well, again, I think Mark, Mark does tell us that, that that is part of how Jesus understands his own mission, to give his life uh, as a ransom for many. He, he does not use the word sin as much as Paul does, but I think that idea of Jesus paying the price, of Jesus um, settling our debt, um, I think we absolutely see that in Mark's gospel. Um, I'm sure we see it in the other ones, but I'm just, I'm, I'm up to my eyeballs in Mark right now, so I know we see it there. Um, Paul Paul's trying to explain the significance of it to people, so he spends more time with it. Um, but I, I think we, we we see that idea in in Mark as well. On this question, this final question you have, um, I'm thinking back um, again. I wasn't there, but I watched the video a couple weeks ago. I uh, was talking about like how the disciples did not not that they didn't have faith but they just thought like 
what ever Jesus would say that they just didn't understand it. And it, you know, they didn't believe things would happen. And I think, um, that's kind of what I try to do as a disciple is to not be like that, to have faith and to try to believe that things are, that God is always with us and that things will always work out. And that's really hard to do. <laughs> So it's, it's more you're, you're able to see in Mark's gospel some examples of what not to do. Yeah. And, and that's okay. Sometimes those are, are very helpful examples. Um, but I think a key part of that is the way Jesus responds to the disciples. Jesus re-engages them. Jesus uses it as, uses it as an opportunity to uh, draw them closer. So even in those moments when we screw up, even in those moments when we need more grace than usual, um, we see in Mark's gospel that, that Jesus' response to that is indeed to show us that grace. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm happy for all the grace I can get. <laughs> I like I like those two can like the passages where like the disciples were disappointing him Jesus they were disappointing him and what they were saying what they were doing right and instead of him getting angry he he took the opportunity to teach them and it's like okay let's take a step back like you know when someone angers us or it doesn't do what we expect instead of just like lashing out it's like okay how can we make this better like how can we maybe you know, teach them the correct way to treat us or the correct way to do whatever is not right. I, that really, I have that like circle and star and I like that. That spoke to me as a teacher, as a mother, as like, that's my life, right? That's my, right. <laughs> that's my constantly correcting or trying, you know, it's like, okay. And that, that's kind of what, what I, I got out of that as well. Um, the uh, you know the idea that uh, when the disciples disappointed or went astray um, it spoke also to us uh, especially in this day and age where if somebody says something that you think is stupid or disagree with you tend to write them off and polarize them you know terribly which is you know kind of what our whole society is like now and and we've even had some of that in in our congregation as a result of the pandemic and some of the effects so i mean to me i think that's a very powerful statement it, it's uh, it's it's patience you know it it's not writing somebody off it's being patient and trying to reason and instead of um writing off scratching off castigating whatever word you want to use and maybe and i'm as as a pastor of course i i, I might bring a different phrase to it but maybe maybe uh rather than reason with uh which we do try to reason with god gives us these fantastic brains that we should use but i think we also want to say let's search for the most faithful response together um, so it's, it's reason, but it's also seeking, seeking God's input. It's seeking what's faithful. Um, but exactly what you said, Tom, it's doing that rather than just saying, ah, they don't know squat. We're not going to listen to them. Two comments that, uh, to follow up on, on the final question, what, what uh, Jesus has called the disciples to do. On uh, verse 15 in chapter 16, it says, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. I think it's pretty clear after going through all these steps to explain it, this is what Jesus said. The only question I have on this one is it is, is in, chap, in, in uh, chapter 16, verse 18, is that meaning figuratively picking up snakes uh, because of uh, vile poisons and stuff that they'll run through the world, or literally picking it up and playing with snakes uh, and, and basically tempting fate? I kind of view that if you take it literally, it's like go out and play in traffic and God's going to keep you from getting run over. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really fascinating 
question. Um, there are, as, as I'm sure you're aware, that there are sects of Christians who practice snake handling. Um, and I don't know this for a fact, but I believe the understanding is you get bitten and you get sick. That means you don't have enough faith. Um, you know, it's... I, I really am not sure. However, I am intrigued by the notion that, remember, who is the one who gets Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden? Or who, you know, nudges them along to get themselves kicked out of the garden? Snakes. <laughs> right. So may maybe something is at work at that level, you know, um, because of what Christ has done. And Mark is the gospel where he says, nobody ransacks the strong man's house unless he's bound the strong man first. Uh, if the strong man knew the thief was coming, he would have done something about it. But Jesus comes in, he binds the strong man by resisting that temptation or, or passing that test, you could say. Um, so maybe because of what Jesus has done, that snake or that serpent, it, it's got nothing on you. Um, maybe that's a little too allegorical, but that, that would be the first place I would go because, and it's not in Mark's gospel, but I do think, and, and I think Tom has heard me say this uh, to the church council uh, with some of the things going on with the pandemic. Um, you know, the tempter brings Jesus up to the top of the temple and says, hey, you know, if, if you trust God so much, hey, uh, throw yourself off the temple because, you know, it says in the Psalms, God will send his angels to lift you up, right? And Jesus says, uh-uh, that is not our place to put God to the test. Um, and so I, I wonder if maybe there is a, a link back to the, the serpent there. Because um, I think in other places, Jesus is pretty clear, you know, don't, don't put God to the test. Don't do stuff that under normal circumstances, no one would do, but because because you say God is going to keep you safe, you go do this thing you know is dangerous. Um, but then again, there could have been people, um, this could have been a, a practice in a community. I, the, the short answer is, I have no clue, but I would be really intrigued to dig and see if there's a connection back to the serpent. Um, but don't play in traffic, Andrew. <laughs> No playing in traffic. No, I seem to be. I seem to remember being told to go play in traffic when I was little, from time to time. <laughs> probably. But, if somebody probably to did remember. not like you. <laughs> other thoughts, other other uh, insights from Mark. Have I convinced you at least that uh, Mark was not a haphazard collection of sayings that some guy slapped together? Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Good. Good, good. Good. I have a question. I hope it doesn't lead us astray here from what we're uh, trying to accomplish. But what is this the shorter ending of Mark and the longer ending of Mark? So the the consensus of the majority of, of your scholars. Uh, and, and folks in mainline denominations is that Mark ends, as written, ends at chapter 16, verse 8. And we talked about that quite a bit uh, over the last couple of weeks in terms of it kind of leaves us in the middle of a cycle of prophecy and fulfillment, or, or not prophecy and fulfillment, but um, human failure. We're waiting for that divine response. Um, it also, remember, this is the beginning of the good news, and it's only the beginning because then it is left on us to go and tell people. Um, so there's a lot of good reason to believe that Mark intended that to be the ending, to kind of leave us hanging so that we can keep going. Um, the thought is that um, people were not satisfied with the ending and various uh, people making the manuscripts added uh, some endings they thought would be more satisfactory. Um, there are some linguistic 
and thematic things in there that seem kind of distinct from the rest of Mark. Um, so on, on those grounds, people are thinking those might have been added later. Um, the And it's probably in one of the footnotes there, but the earliest manuscripts that they've found, the ones that they feel are the most reliable, end at verse 8. There's other manuscripts they found that have um, the shorter ending and others that have the uh, verses 9 through 16. Um, but I believe the most commonly held opinion is that verse 8 was it. And some people went, that's not much of an ending. You know, we, we've had this amazing journey with Jesus. You can't leave it like that. And so they put an ending on it that they believed was a faithful um, faithful ending to the story. I mean, it tells people, go out and, and tell people. It tells people Jesus is going to allow you to do fantastic things for the sake of his kingdom. So it's not necessarily that what's in there is um, you know, bad material uh, or, or not a faithful witness to God, but it likely is not the, um, the original ending of Mark's gospel. Uh, Luther, of course, uh, cites some stuff from that extended version of chapter 16. I believe in the small catechism, he talks about, uh, you know, he says, as it says in Mark 16, I don't remember the verse, but um, that, that debate as to where does Mark actually end, it's been going on for a long time. Um, I think your point that it's faithful because that really does dovetail nicely with the Great Commission at the end of the book of Matthew. Right. And so, so it, 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 is, it isn't something that doesn't disagree with the other, other gospel. Right. And I think that that commonality there with the other gospels is one of the reasons why some of the scholars are thinking people may have had Matthew and Luke and John and said, they've got great material about what happens after the resurrection. Let's Let's use that and, and kind of help bring Mark to a little more satisfying conclusion. So some of that overlap um, is part of the reason why some people are saying this may not have been there originally. Um, but yeah, there, you know, I don't think there's anything in there that we would look at and go, you know, it doesn't say, and then Jesus, you know, died again after that or anything like that. Um, but the, the best, the most reliable manuscripts we have and some of the literary analysis says that was probably added later Again, although can i just add that it is kind of interesting the part that was added is the part that has the snake charming in it right <laughs> yes um so yeah it's uh it's an interesting question um isn't it isn't it common in those days to add on to original authors material as an addendum, like a book of Isaiah, for example, there's three different authors, one doubt tale and another, at that time it was perfectly acceptable, right? Right, and and I think certainly in Isaiah um, and with some of Paul's letters, it, it's kind of done with this idea of if I attribute it to Isaiah or I attribute this to Paul, people are going to actually give it more attention and again it's done in a way you know so so like these different authors who contributed to the book of isaiah they didn't come in and say something completely contradictory to what isaiah was saying they were saying you know we think this is something he would say um but yeah that was definitely a practice you, you would attribute the work to someone else uh in the hope that it would get noticed a little more Thank you. You're welcome. Any other thoughts or, or parting, parting bits of wisdom on, on Mark's gospel? So you're surprising us next week with something? I can tell you. Do, do you want to know what we're doing next week? No. <laughs> okay, well, I tell you what. Why don't we pray together, 
and then whoever doesn't want to know what we're doing next week, <laughs> sign off, and then I'll tell everybody who does want to know. Is that fair? <laughs> oh, that's fair. Uh, I like the anticipation. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, let us pray. Our Father, who art in who heaven, heaven, hallowed, be, hallowed thy name. be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come, come, thy will be, thy done, will be done, done on earth, on as, earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our bread. daily bread and, and forgive us our trespasses as we, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Hi, right, group. If you would prefer to be left in suspense, we'll invite you to go ahead and sign off. If you want to know what we're doing next week, I'll hold on momentarily. And I will fill you in. I'm holding. Okay. <laughs> Good night, you all. Thank you. All right. Looks like everyone else wants to know. <laughs> we have a, uh, a brief introduction uh, to the Book of Concord, which is our um, official collection of Lutheran theological confessional writings. Uh, and then I'm going to give you my, my top 10 citations out of the Book of Concord, the 10 that uh, uh, I use the most and that I find most significant. Um, so we are going to be spending some some quality time with uh, not just Martin Luther, uh, but some of his uh, contemporaries like uh, Philip Melanchthon and Johannes Bugenhagen, uh, Martin Chemnitz, and all sorts of uh, fun old time Germans. So, um, and I suspect it's not real often that the word fun goes together with old time Germans. So, uh, so there. I don't know. Martin Luther said beer was a theological drink. <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> That's the only time Germans are any fun, too. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, oh, no. we're, not, we're not known for being the, the smiliest people in the world. But, uh, but uh, well, so yeah, that is that is what awaits us next week. So uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, everybody, for your... Uh, uh, willingness to journey with me through Mark's gospel, and uh, I hope it has uh, has been a blessing to all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stay, Stay safe, and, Stay safe and warm. Yes. Auf Wiedersehen. Everybody take care. Auf Wiedersehen. Good night. Good night. <laughs>